Welcome to Film Detour, a podcast where two longtime film buddies take you down and around the back alleys and side streets of cinema. With the occasional left-hand turn. I'm John Knappick. And I'm Bob Muller. So let's go. John, you ready? I'm ready. Let's hit it. Today we're doing a Halloween show. Uh, John and I were talking about uh, some some movies that really influences us kids. Uh, in, in, you mean scared the crap out yeah, of us? Yeah, influence is not really the right word. You're right. Oh uh, yeah, scared the crap out of us. Uh, so, so Horror Hotel was made in 1961, and uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's 76 beautiful minutes. They have the cheapo budget of cheapo budgets. It's yes. all done in the studio, and they do such a beautiful job with it. Yeah. It's, it's all about mood, right, John? What really works is that the way they're saving the money, they use it to great effect. Oh, my God. Because clearly you can't see a lot in a studio, so everything's night. Everything's at night. There's fog everywhere. It's so atmospheric, it works really well. It reminds me of the Twilight Zone, the way they used to do the Twilight Zone episodes, because yeah. they're all con- condensed down, and they only had limited sets and limited props and whatnot. So they, believe me, all that... Money is on the screen. And it adds to the creepiness. It's beautiful. This was made by Vulcan Film Productions, which was an early precursor to... Amicus. Uh, And uh, it it was started by Milton Sabotsky, who wrote the story for Horror Hotel. And Amicus was this production company in England. Right. And they specialized in uh, a type of film called a portmanteau film. That's very sophisticated, John. Well, that's what they do call them. It's funny when you look them up. Uh, and those are basically those stories you see. They're episodic. They usually contain three to four stories within a movie. And a, and a host a lot of the times, right? Yeah. John, sort of a host. You know, like the Crypt Keeper would be or something like that. And they usually have a lot of great stars in them, like B-movie stars. Yes. They gather all these different stars in there. And Absolutely. They, uh, they they had a whole run in, starting in the mid-60s the to house the 70s. Drip, the House That Drip Blood. Uh, really fantastic movie. Dr. Terror's House of Horrors. Right. Uh, Asylum is another one. From Beyond the Grave. And also, the most famous, I would say, would be the Tales from the Crypt. Uh, This film, we're going to call it Horror Hotel. That's the American title of the film. Uh, It was originally called what? City of the Dead. City of the Dead, the original British title. Which is a great great name. I think it's a really, probably a better name. But something about the alliteration of Horror Hotel and seeing the credits come up when I was sitting home on a rainy afternoon by myself... Uh, so, who directed this bomb? John Llewellyn Moxie. And we, we know he did a lot of television stuff. Yeah, yeah. He did The Saint, The Avengers, Hawaii Five O, Mannix, NYPD. Remember NYPD, John? And. Dun, 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 dun. The Cold Night Stalker, Stalker. Night Kolchak. Stalker. So, the cinematographer for this was Desmond Dickinson. A, a, Amazing. And yeah. this guy, John, this guy's been working since the 20s, from the 20s to the 70s. He did everything from um, Olivier's Hamlet. Uh, the Rocking Horse Winner. A Study in Terror, which is a which is a Sherlock Holmes one done in the 60s. The yes. Browning version. Berserk with, uh, Berserk with Joan Crawford. And of course, the classic Trog. With Joan Crawford. With Joan Crawford. In her, in her slumming years. Right. And then the screenplay. It's uh, by George Baxt, and he wrote um, something called Circus of Horror and Burn Witch Burn. He did, which was Burn Witch Burn was a rewrite from Richard Matheson and Charles Bowman. I guess they weren't that crazy uh, about it, so they wanted right. to beef it up or something. So who's in this film? We have Christopher Lee as Alan Driscoll. So Christopher Lee, uh, as we know, is in a lot of Hammer films, Hammer horror films, uh, such as uh, Dracula Has Risen from the Grave. Uh, the Mummy. The which, is a, which is a really great remake of the Universal. The House That Drip Blood. Mm-hmm. The Wicker Man. He's in The Wicker Man. I love The He's Wicker in Man. a lot of films. Yeah. I mean, we can go on and on here. But Classic horror film, uh, Stolworth actor. He actually played Dracula, Count Dracula, 11 times. Really? In my calculation. Right. No, that could be off right. one or two. That sounds about right. So who else is in this film? Uh, we also have uh, an actress. Her name is Patricia Jessel. Uh, she plays one of the witches, Elizabeth Selwyn. Or Miss Newless. She's, she's right. also Miss Newless. A dual role. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Venetia Stevenson is yes. Nan Barlow. Nan Barlow. She's terrific. Well, for me, 
What I love about it is it opens up like a like like a like a punch in the face. It has this bombastic music. It's like a night on Bold Mountain or yeah. something like that. They're kind of chanting. Yeah, and then they. But they, it's very creepy. But it has. It, you have to have some satanic chanting to really get your blood going. <laughs> but think about it. This was like the mid '60s, and when you're, even if you're seeing this as a kid, yeah. you're not really familiar with all this kind of this no. world of chanting and demonic whatever it's it's spooky yeah um, i mean it, it starts out the music is creepy uh it, it's kind of overwhelming and and then you have the title chords which are really simple but they're really effective yeah. they're paintings of of hooded figures you can't see their face they're kind of like uh the ghosts of christmas yet to come yeah, yeah you know and then and then as as the as the credits roll they they show you different hooded figures and then there's one with this kind of bony finger sticking with a with a claw nail coming out of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, kind of pointing. And, and you have this uh, opening shot, which is really great. It has this 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 really foggy uh, uh, outdoor scene and it has this fire pit in the left-hand corner. And then you have these figures coming out of the mist. These like pilgrims. Well, yeah, because you, you can tell by the hats. It's all in silhouette. But it's, it's actually a mob of pilgrims. Yeah. And that's, that's never good. But they're marching towards us. Right. And they, they seem pretty agitated, and, to say the least. And it's almost like a Fellini film in that the faces are amazing. That, well, yeah, these... I, I, I'm glad you said that. It, it reminded me of a combination, because when they, they start to do close-ups of these guys, yeah. you, 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 you see the way Fellini did it, especially in, in say, right. Eight and a Half or something like that, or even Sergio Leone, yeah. with these really close close-ups, and you're getting these different perspectives of these odd faces. So you have all these townspeople, and they're, they're yelling out, which... Right. They're going to find the witch that's in town. They're they're they, they they they're set up to go. They're marching toward you, and they know which house to go to, and they want it. They want to get this witch, who is Elizabeth Selwyn. That's her name, right? So so we have these people come in to this house, and they grab this woman. What I, what I love about it is she she actually hisses at them. Yeah. <laughs> she actually hisses at them. And then she spits at them, of course. But I, I love the hiss, like a snake or something. It was, it was terrific. But also she's got this like long black hair. Right. What's always interesting about this in this movie, you see it like the, the townspeople, they look so like kind of boring and whatever. And this woman looks like the hippie chick. Absolutely. Absolutely the hippie <laughs> chick. She's like attractive. You She's bet. got kind of that look to her. She's a little sexy-ish, you know, and like that's the one they want to burn. What? Yeah, because she's very opinionated, right? Yeah, yeah right. She's, 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 she's like her own person. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Can't have that. She has her own mind. No good. So they grab her and, and they start pulling her out toward the door. And I love that shot where you have uh, her, her point of view. It has this one face of this woman and another face of another woman. They just look at her, yeah, and then they look backwards at at the at the um, the stake, which which got all the kindling and stuff underneath. Yes, and and then she just freaks out, and they start pulling her toward it, pulling her toward she it. She sees that stake, and she does freak out. And she comes outside, and she calls to her lover. I guess it's her lover, Jethro. Jethro. And who do we see in the back of the crowd? This this one guy. They it, the camera kind of focuses on. He denies, kind of. Knowing her, right? Or exactly. Consorting with her, yeah. He he's been consorting with her for some time. They they're yeah. on a first name basis. Yeah. And what a weasel! Uh, yeah. He says, I, I, "I don't know. I, I have no idea who she is." And he like obviously abandons her at the worst possible time. Yeah, exactly. What a boyfriend. So they put it. So they put her onto the um, stake. Uh, they the, tie her to the stake. To the stake, and 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 they're they're getting ready to light the fire and whatnot. But like you said, I love those Fellini close-ups. Yeah. And it, it just cuts around to the crowd, and they're all kind of really into this. They really want. They're angry. Yeah. They're 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 excited. Yeah, absolutely. I love the point of view shot yeah. of basically you know the 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 sticks and twigs and whatnot of the yeah. fire because they lay this torch down and it comes right toward you. But you see the anguish on her face yeah. when she sees them about to light that fire. There's a shot of her, her face. She yeah. really gets scared so, because before that she's kind of defiant. Yeah, like she's like snarling back at them but yeah, there's no way to go now right she's gonna burn yeah she is now basically being lit on fire and she finally gives it up and calls for help she calls to satan and jethro chimes in that's quietly right. help her lucifer help her he's a little late yeah <laughs> thanks <laughs> jethro you know jethro could have said hey lucifer give us a break right now before right. he actually gets put up <laughs> and burned to death Gosh. he's a little late but i guess better with, late than never with friends like that yeah. who needs enemies <laughs> And this is where the lines, they start chanting, like she starts burning on the stake. Right. And she starts to chant, 
I have made my pact with thee, O Lucifer. And she goes on. And Jethro also chimes in from the back of the crowd. These are the lines they cut out for the American version. Oh, so it was it was too too. Actually, it's pretty funny. We were still puritanical even in the nineteen sixties. Yeah, in in, in in America because they had to cut those couple couple of Lucifer references. Like what is that? Like the, in well, we England, know they're bad guys. Yeah, in well, England we know, they can hear this. Why can't we hear it in America? But, it doesn't make any sense. But we know they're bad guys. Okay, they're they're you know. Satan worshiper, not yeah. a good guy. Okay, we can understand that. So why why is it a problem? I, I mean, understand. at some point she says, like, for all eternity shall I practice the ritual of black mass. So maybe just in the U.S. we're so church oriented that yeah. was just too much. I don't yeah. know. So they did cut that out. That's what they cut out. That's and amazing. As she's burning, I just have to tell you, she does give. A, she does scream out a curse. She does curse this town, right. uh, something like make the city an example of the vengeance. But so she curses the town on the stakes, and the crowd reacts to it. Some of the women look at each other like, I don't know if they even mentioned. We it didn't that. see that coming. Yeah, <laughs> couldn't she just burn and be quiet? So she actually fesses up to being a witch, and she's cursing them. Wow. Um, and then you start to see all these faces, and and they start chanting, "Burn witch, burn witch, burn witch." Burn witch. Burn witch. And then they cut to the modern day from 1692, right to Christopher Lee saying, burn witch, burn witch, burn witch. His eyes are kind of bulging out of his head. And he's talking to his class. In uh, this college yeah. in New England. Yeah. He's in the middle of this lecture. Uh, Professor Driscoll, as we said, played by Christopher Lee. And he's all caught up in this whole, um, you know, fervor of this witch getting burned and the crowd talking about this. Yeah. We, we learn a, bit, a little bit later on there, he has reason to feel really upset about this whole situation. Let me get this right. He's teaching a class on witchcraft? Is well, that he, the idea? He's a history professor, yes, but this particular class is, is witchcraft. Right. And it's this typical American class. They're all kind of like, very clean cut looking kids, except for the boyfriend. Uh, he talks to this one girl, Nan, who's yeah. who's kind of the center of attention. The store, and, his store pupil. And her boyfriend, Bill, uh, he wants nothing to do with the class. He's obviously, just, this, this is, is boring stuff. Obviously, this is an elective. <laughs> he's, too, <laughs> he's too cool for witchcraft. I'm like, right. dude, this is pretty interesting stuff. Right, You're right. like, you want nothing to do with it. He just wants to take his girlfriend out. He just wants to go out and have That's soda it. with his girl. That's right. Basically, she wants to do a paper on on witchcraft, and and Christopher Lee says, "Look, I got I got a great place for you to go to do hands on research. Right, a little he's, town called Whitewood. And this is the he's been explaining this this burning of the witch to this class, and and now he's going to point this student who wants to do a paper on to witchcraft. exactly where she got burned at the stake. So he says he mentions Whitewood, uh, and he asks and and he tells her to go to the Ravens Inn. I believe it's the only hotel in town. <laughs> <laughs> and and you'll see why when you get there. Right. So she uh she she decides she wants to go to uh to to Whitewood and do this research. Uh, and she has to tell her brother and her boyfriend because they're supposed to meet up at a, a birthday party for uh a cousin, a cousin or... Anne or something. Right. And the brother a little cosmopolitan guy. He doesn't want her to go. He's like, you know, on her own. And, and the boyfriend obviously protests. She's intent on going. But the brother's, a, he's he's a science teacher. Okay. He's so right. so there's, there, there, it's kind of, there's there's kind of some tension going on between uh, Christopher Lee and, and the brother because, you know, he thinks this, this, this uh, occult stuff is a bunch of mumbo jumbo. I want to see facts and figures. That's how I live. That's right. The whole idea is this, this young co-ed is going to drive off to New England. Uh, on her own to stay at some inn in some little town to uh, research witchcraft. What could happen? Nothing. <laughs> so she goes to Whitewood, and on the way she stops. It's of course it's a foggy night that she's driving up there, and she stops to ask directions at this gas station. And the guy uh, tells her that that's not such a good idea. You mean Sam Truckers? <laughs> Yeah, it is it is very Hooterville. What I love about it, though, is like it seems like it, the way it's edited, it just seems like it takes her 10 minutes to get there. Yeah. She's driving, yeah. and suddenly, and of course, I have to say, I'm just going to step back. Everything in this movie is fog. Like, as yeah. soon as she gets to New England, it's foggy. And I mean foggy, like, and it's night. And clearly, they're doing this to, to hide the sets. I mean... They're in a studio. You can't see the walls, so everything's dark. But that atmosphere from that fog, John, it just it takes you and grabs you by the throat and won't let go. 
So the production design, I just want to call him out. His name is John Blissard. I thought he did a great job with this. Fantastic. Yeah. I mean, it's it just, it's, he makes, once again, they, they make every frame count. It's all there on the screen. <laughs> Maybe they should have called it City of Fog. There you go. So, um, so she stops in the fog at this gas station and she asks the guy, you know, um, so uh, is this the way to get to Whitewood? And what does he do? He says, basically, that's not a good idea. I don't think you want to go there. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, so she says- And uh, she like just blithely ignores him. Right. Just like, yeah, I'm go-. she doesn't even listen to him. She says, I'm in a hurry. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that pretty much says it all. What is it with young couples? These teenagers young today. In these, in these horror films. Don't they ever get the hint? So she, she drives on a little further in the fog and she gets lost again. And she sees this tall, dark- silhouette standing in the fog and she asks him for directions she pulled at a crossroads right You're driving in the fog at night if i had three guns in the car at, i wouldn't stop the, for this guy at the at crossroads. crossroads it sounds like robert guy, johnson to me yeah this tall guy in the fog at night so he's 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 uh he's standing there uh with this as a silhouette he's backlit he, he it kind of looks like you know the uh, the poster from the exorcist <laughs> you know so um he uh, happens to be going that way, and sh- he says, you know, would uh, would you mind giving me a ride? So she says, sure. Get in. Why not? And, and he does say his name, Jethro Keen. And I'd give him a ride. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the exorcist wasn't out then, so maybe she didn't see the poster. Right. She didn't see the poster. So she, just, she didn't know what was coming. So, of course, you're going to ask a strange man into your car in the middle of the night. So so she pulls into town and it's it's all fog and, and dark shadows and, and she turns to ask her uh, her passenger a question and he's gone. And out that window is the town cemetery. Right. Very creepy. Yes. Um, it's a, a perfect spot to just stop by. But so, like, wouldn't you... Okay, I'm sorry. I just have to keep harping on this. Go, John. These things bother me in films. Yeah. <laughs> so you pick up a strange guy in the night. It's foggy. It's a town. You're going to research witchcraft. You turn. The guy disappeared. No alarm bells are going off in this girl's head. That's it. Nothing. Check, please. <laughs> turn the car around. We're done. I would, be, would you even stay? I'd be like, where's the, the nearest 7-Eleven? I'm this just, girl is doggedly determined <laughs> to get that research done no matter what. Oh, my God. So she... Uh, so she goes into the hotel that Professor which, Driscoll... Which is called the Raven's Inn. Right, the Raven's Inn. And she's uh, greeted by the maid, uh, who's trying to tell us something, but she's mute. The Lottie. <laughs> yeah. Lottie. Of course, she has to be mute. Yeah, and it's this creepy-looking girl who can't talk, and she's kind of moaning to her. And on the wall, she sees behind the desk... The placard. There's a placard. On this site, Elizabeth Selwyn was burned. Was burned. At th- burned at the stake in 1692. So who enters? Uh, Miss Newless. Miss Newless. She's standing on... She's, it's a really neat shot, yeah. her entrance. She's standing on the stairway, and her face is completely obscured by shadow. So it's just this figure standing there, and then she walks down the stairs and into the light. Um, and we find out that she is Mrs. Newless. She looks a lot like Elizabeth Selwyn, though, who burned Does the she? stake. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wonder why. Just with her hair pulled back, that's all. In witchcraft and all these movies, I don't know if it, it's a trope or whatever, uh, Newless is kind of the reverse of Selwyn. Yeah, it's a little thing they do in witchcraft. Um, so, so Mrs. Newless takes Nan to her room. and um, But she says, we're all full for the night, right? There's, right, yes. There's, it's all Hallow's Eve. Right. right. And they're full for the night. But we just happen to have this one room on the first floor here. <laughs> Only because Professor Driscoll sent her. Oh, Up until right. that point, she was not going to let her have the room. So she told supposedly. him, Professor Driscoll. Yes. So she let her have the room. Exactly. Oh, okay, great. So so Mrs. Newell takes Nan to her room. And um, sneaking around the corner, we see the figure of Jethro Keen, who we just saw in the car a few minutes ago. Yes, uh, appear again, yeah. and looking all sinister. Right. And then again, we she, we go into her room, and she's looking around, and she trips over a rug on the floor. Right. A throw what? rug, and then she uncovers a trap door. A trap door in your room. It's never a good sign, John. <laughs> Never and again, does does the poor lass take the hint? Well, you know, there is one thing. There was no, there is no pull ring to pull the door open. Oh. So, so what do you do? You just put the rug back on and you go out for the evening. <laughs> <laughs> so that means you can't go into the trap door, but certainly they can come out of it. Right? I mean, come on. 
Uh, so she starts, she goes for a little walk through town. Right. And she again, wants to see the town, see what's going on. But you have to, you have to, once again, you have to picture this when you're watching the movie, you'll, you'll see what I'm saying, that it's, it's nothing but darkness, shadows, fog. Fog. It couldn't look creepier. <clears throat> and, and creepy old buildings. Because another thing about it's, this It's town, not like you're, you're going to go take in the East Village or something. Yeah. <laughs> this is like the town time forgot. There's nothing really new in yeah. this town. It's yeah. just like the old buildings. Yeah, what, what happens is she walks by and she's heading toward the church. Um, she wants to see this old church that she finds to be beautiful. Yes. So she heads toward the church and a couple walks by and they stop and they turn to stare at her. Yeah. And they don't move. They really look like creepy. statues. Yeah. And no matter how far she walks away, they just stay there. And then another person comes walking by and they stop. And they stare. Very creepy. And they don't move either. Mm. And this, these are one. That's one of those moments as a kid you see, you notice. Like I was like, what are these people doing? But they're frozen. That's yeah. the creepy thing with the fog all going around. Right I just see. I just got chills up my spine <laughs> just talking about it. <laughs> How many years later, we're it, still it, getting chills. It doesn't make a difference. And it sticks. It sticks when you're a kid. It sticks for you for forever. And again, it's all just done with atmospherics. There's no special effects here. It's just the setting, the setting, the fog, the people, the out the wardrobe. It just works so well. And she walks up to the church and she she tries to get into the church. I, I love the old blind priest. He's fantastic. And she's she's standing there. He won't let her in. He blocks the door with his but cane. But that's creepy. When he yeah. first opens the door, he just comes out of the dark. It's like a, you feel like it's a, it's a monster or something, yeah, yeah. right? It's just like a shock effect that and this, really works. And this old blind priest bars the door with his cane. He won't let her in. That I mean, he basically says evil has triumphed over good in this town. So he tries to warn her off, but she really isn't going to do it. I love, I love, I, I just had to jump in here again with, with this thing. This reminds me so much of, of Hitchcock. The lighting, yes. Especially when she's standing on the porch there. There's a the the, the way she's backlit, yeah. and there's a, there's not quite enough light on her face. It's kind of reflected off the door, right. so she's kind of in shadow. It's really beautifully done as a grayishness. It's very Hitchcock, very psycho. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? The black and white Hitchcock, and and what's great is he he tries to warn her off as best he can, and as he warns her off, he starts to fade into the blackness. Yeah, he just bit disappears by bit. Yeah bit by bit until he's totally gone as if he disappeared <laughs> so creepy. so our our intrepid researcher nan barlow you know is weirded out by it but she go, goes she's gonna go back to the hotel she's dogged she's gonna get keep moving forward in this and she endeavor. comes and she comes out from the church down from the stairs and this th then these two people these two older women pass her as yeah. well and they turn and there's a close-up of them with these really creepy faces frozen solid in time. Yeah. And you can see the way the shot is when they cut from the close up, you see they're in the left hand corner and then you see the one guy frozen in time staring and the couple who came in the first time walked past are still frozen too. So they're all frozen just staring at her. And is it my imagination or do all these townsfolk look familiar? Yeah, they do. <laughs> it's not your imagination. <laughs> They look very, I've seen them before. They look very 1692 to me. Ah, oh, I see. <laughs> that was too much for her, so she got creeped out enough. Yeah. Finally. Finally. She, and she, she, she sees yeah. a light on in this antique slash bookstore, and she just says, I don't care. I'm gotcha. going in there. So she goes running into this store that has a light on, and it's a bookstore. And uh, finally, we meet someone who appears normal. Right. This, this Miss Russell. Pat. Pat Russell, who's tells us she's running this bookstore for her deceased aunt and her uncle is apparently the reverend is that true uh, i think that's her grandfather okay so she's running this shop for her deceased aunt and her grandfather is the reverend uh so uh, nan is telling her about her project and pat pulls out a book on, uh, on devil worship right and gives it to, loans it to her good bedtime reading in this <laughs> town i'd say <laughs> if you weren't scared or not wouldn't Here's keep me awake yeah. So we go back to her room. Uh, and she's working on the term paper. She's working on a term paper. And, uh, you know, just like any other peaceful night in an inn in New England. And we, hear we hear some, and we hear some medieval chant coming chant from below the floor. From the trap door. Yeah. You hear chanting. And 
She's looking around like, oh, what's that? She brings Miss Newlis to the room. Yeah, she goes running outside to get Mrs. Newlis. Because, you know, Newlis. something, the, the air conditioner doesn't work in your room, the chanting. You got to go to the, uh, the manager to, to come complain. Yeah. Right. If so. you're staying at a Motel 6, you're going to do the same thing. <laughs> I tell you, if I'm in a Motel 6 and I handle chanting, I'm going over Check, to uh, Hampton Inn. Thank, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, so she brings her in. And, of course, what happens when they get to the room? Yeah. So Mrs. Newells basically just dismisses her, and she says, uh, I don't hear any noises, quote unquote. <laughs> uh, no, I didn't hear anything. There's only dirt under that floor. They filled that in a long time ago. That's what she says. And yeah, there's yeah. no pull ring, so you don't have to worry <laughs> about that trap door. No, come on. So uh, inexplicably, the next scene, suddenly she hears music playing, and there's... And she opens the door, and there's this party going on in the lobby. The guests are all dancing. Like, and I think Miss Newlis mentioned it earlier. This the function going on for Candlemas Eve. Candlemas Eve. Yeah. So you open the door. And I there's... always go dancing on Candlemas Eve. <laughs> but it's it's hilarious. Like this creepy town, and you open the and suddenly the lobby, this tiny lobby, is filled with these young couples, well dressed, dancing, just really enjoying themselves on just... Candlemas Eve at That's midnight. Right. It's kind of like a witch or go go or something. <laughs> yes. And then, what does she do? She goes back into she, her room. She goes back into her room. She's, gonna, she's in her. She's in like her house coat. House coat or bathroom. Well, it wasn't yeah, really. Yeah. It's, it's, it's. She's in a robe. Yeah. And 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 finally, she decides after studying for a while and working on the term paper, she decides that she um, she's going to go out and 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 join the guests and dance, which yes. I know I would do too. Right? Yeah, yeah, you know, you're you're in a witch. strange place. There are people you don't know. You're just going to go out and dance with these people. <laughs> so she takes off her robe. And she has this corset underneath. Oh, right. Suddenly. <laughs> and silk stockings. Like, and garter belts. <laughs> and I'm thinking, yeah, sure. When you're studying at home under your robe, you always wear a corset, garter belts, and silk stockings. So let's step back half a step. She does call Miss Newless into the room to show her this old manuscript from the book. Right. That talks about this coven of witches. They mocked the young girl before sacrifice right. by taking a personal item of hers. And, and by the way, Nan's bracelet is suddenly missing. And leaving a dead bird and a sprig of woodbine. Woodbine, right. And as you said, what what happens? What so What's missing? Nan's a bracelet is missing. Like literally two seconds later. <laughs> yes. She just finishes the sentence and it's gone. So she takes a, a little while to get dressed. Yeah. And 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 she she puts on a nice little outfit over her uh, over her uh, frilly underwear. Sexy lingerie. Se sexy lingerie, right? And then she goes outside and the millisecond she opens the door, the music stops and everybody's gone. Like nothing. Nothing. The, it just literally All you can hear is tick tock tick <laughs> talk from the clock in the hallway and then she's like where did everybody go and she's told the guests have gone to services uh where she see and then she looks and there is a calendar that says candle mass eve candle mass eve it's all starting to dawn on her so she's back in her room and she opens her drawer and what does she find she finds the dead bird with some little arrow stuck through it she like, turns and she looks at the doorway and it has woodbine on it okay at this point, would you take a hint? That's it. Like, what would you do? Hello, Uber. I'm done. I, like, but <laughs> I, don't, she, I don't even want to drive. Does she take the hint? No. No, no, no. no and no. then suddenly, the shade in the window goes flipping up. And you hear tink, 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 tink. And it just so happens on the pull ring of the shade is the pull ring for the trap door. And out the window, she sees this group of Procession. People. Coming through of hooded figures. But through the cemetery, hooded figures walking through the cemetery. Right. Okay. Chanting. Time to leave, right? <laughs> exactly. She sees this little thing hanging. She grabs it. What does she do? Trap door. She pulls a tippy hedron. <laughs> That's what she does. She pulls a tippy hedron. Like, why would you suddenly go for the trapdoor? But that's what she does. She goes downstairs, and the way the lighting is reminds me mm. so much of Hitchcock. Yeah. The way she's got the flashlight and the lighting behind her and whatnot, it's it's a beautiful shot. I yeah. mean, as a still shot itself, it's beautiful. 
it has this feeling of of when when she's starting to go downstairs these these stone stairs yeah. and the pillars it's it's like catacombs and on one of the pillars there are chains and it seems like manacles attached to it <laughs> another reason to turn around and go back get your butt out of there right Tiffy, um, come on <laughs> so she's walking through this it's this, classic this horror cavern. film stuff but it's it's classic horror film stuff and the chanting's increasing and of course suddenly she's grabbed by these two uh, robed, hooded worshippers. And they drag her, screaming, you know, into this room, and, the, and she sees there's an altar. It's, it's a like, stone altar. You know this is not good. Suddenly, uh, Miss Newless appears, and Professor Driscoll are among the worshippers. Uh, for Candlemas Eve, for, for, for this, this satanic ritual that they're doing, they have to wait for the hour of 13. Gotcha. In order for them to carry out this sacrifice. And so they get her and they're waiting and uh, Selwyn uh, or Mrs. Newless is holding this huge sacrificial knife. The right. thing is gigantic. You know, I know you know it's the woman is lying there and it's part of a horror movie, but you feel so horrible for Nan because she's begging for her life. Yeah. Please, Mrs. Newless, please. Yes. And Mrs. Newless says, I'm Elizabeth Selwyn. Yeah. Once again, I just got chills at the back of my spine. <laughs> Creepily said, in the background. Christopher Lee in the hood. I mean, if she ever, if she saw him, that must have like just freaked her the hell Absolutely. out. Absolutely. And this knife just comes down and we do another Another beautiful cut. cut. Yeah. It cuts. We don't see any blood or any, any gore. It just, it, it just, the knife comes down to a cut. Mid stroke. And then they cut. To cousin Anne's birthday party, it's the cake getting cut, and so, that is that is that particular cut is something I have remembered my whole life. Yeah, even at birthday parties, I think I think of this particular thing. And and so the brothers at this birthday party right. of the cousin, um, and the and the boyfriend comes in. I just have to point out this curious. I don't know if you noticed coincidence. You mentioned it's funny earlier. You mentioned Alfred Hitchcock, right? In black and white. There's something very interesting about this plot. It's very similar to the first third of Psycho. Right, because we're talking about the blonde, beautiful star. Yeah. She dies halfway in or, to or the movie. Or even a third. And like, same kind of thing where she's driving off into the night to some remote location. Right. I mean, that's where the coincidence ends. Did it, did it, did it, did it. They were filmed the very same year. I had an old friend of mine who believed in currents. Yeah. In creative currents in life. Okay. That even if even if somebody's doing something in a totally different part of the world right. and they come up with some sort of concept yeah. and then they put it on record or or, or they, they write a book or do a movie yeah. and somebody else is, you know, in New Jersey yeah. and they do the some same same kind of thing, it's it's almost like currents. So it, it I don't think Hitchcock stole anything or whatever. No, no. They were done the same time. And, but and it's it's very, very similar in a lot of ways. And it feels like Hitchcock. And I mean that in the in the best possible sense yeah. for the cinematographer and the production designer. Because well, it's beautiful. For Psycho, Hitchcock did that on a TV budget. It wasn't right. a big universal movie budget. Right. And that's why it looks that way. It's got a great independent feel, Psycho. Really cool coincidence. They're at the party. They're expecting Nan to come. Right. So the boyfriend, Bill, and her brother, like, where is she? she? She should be here. So they decide to call the cops. She's missing. And they end up going to Driscoll's office. Okay. And they're trying to find out from Christopher Lee, you know, where'd you send my sister to? And what's this all about? And, and, and he pretty much brushes it all off like it's no big deal. Right. You worry about these things. So he says, I'm going to go. The brother says, I'm going to go there anyway. He goes, well, I don't think you want to do that. And he says, why? And he goes, well, because you're probably just making a lot out of nothing. Yeah, great excuse. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Christopher Lee. Yeah, nice job. So at this time, Pat Russell, yes. whose grandfather is the old priest and she was she the managing bookstore. the bookstore, she comes to talk to Driscoll too because Nan is missing. And yes. she never came back for the book that she loaned her in the first place. So this all seems like a big question mark to all three of these people. So finally, um, the brother, the boyfriend, and Pat have a little powwow. And they say, okay, look, we got to go back. And we got to look into this because we're not, we're not cool on this. We think there's something really wrong. So Pat heads back to, this is a funny scene, Pat heads back to New England. Down that same road. Once again, once again, we stop at the gas station because yeah. it's foggy and she's not sure what the heck's going on. I love this whole sequence because each 
individual person sets out by themselves. Yes, all and, three of them. And all three of them stop at the gas station <laughs> to ask this guy. Why can't they commute? How do you I, get the white I, Why can't they commute together? I don't understand. Yeah, anyway. a little carpooling or something. It's, you know, save some time. But she goes first and she runs into uh, Jethro. Jethro Keen. Does she pull over for him? Yeah, she pulls over for him because she's, once again, she's kind of lost too because it's very foggy and she can't see where the heck she's going. And he happens to just be standing there at the crossroads. Hello, Robert Johnson. <laughs> and she picks him up. What is it with the young women in this film? As you as you were alluding to next, both men stop at Sam Drucker's gas Separately, station. Separately, at different, you know, like, one, why? one pulls in, the next, it's all very, it's all very Green Acres, it's all very Udeville. And then Bill, the boyfriend, is driving on the road, and suddenly he sees a weird vision in the middle of the road. This is the key image in this movie that just... Scared the shit out of me. I think you know from that point on. Yeah. I mean this this is the this is the scene that got to me. He's <laughs> driving down the road. Now you know, the thing the thing of it is, when I watched this movie originally, I was a little kid. I don't know, probably eight years old or something. Yeah. Nobody was home, and all I can think of now when I was watching it recently is why didn't I shut it off? <laughs> why did I watch this whole thing? So so the boyfriend's driving down the road. He's the third one in line. And he's driving down the road, and all of a sudden, he sees in the middle of the road Elizabeth Selwyn burning at the stake, <laughs> like, laughing what? hysterically, laughing maniacally. <laughs> and he doesn't know what to do, so he freaks out, and he crashes, boom, right into this tree. And the car starts on fire. It's twisted and, 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 and pushed over on its side. And he has to eventually climb out of it. Yeah. And he's really beat up. He, he's really, he could he barely He gets out of the car out. And, and he just, he collapses by the tree. And uh, I, what is it about when you're a kid? I, I have a similar thing. Like, I'm watching these scary movies and my parents don't give a damn. Like, <laughs> no supervision whatsoever. I would like look over at them and go, you're letting me watch this? <laughs> I, but see, John, I had no backup. I, I was dumber than you because I wasn't even sitting there with my parents. I was sitting here on a, on a rainy afternoon watching this movie from beginning to end. I mean, I should have shut it off when I saw the credits, for Christ's sake. <laughs> so the bill crashes. Uh, and, of course, we get to town. And, again, foggy is all get out. Right. Um, uh, and the brother goes walking through the town. Uh, he he gets to the church. What's really interesting about the scene is is the brother retraces Nan's steps, basically. He goes to the hotel, and he yeah. talks to Mrs. Newless. He checks into the same room as her, and then he wants to go find, he heads towards the church like she does. And as he's walking up the street with the fog, a couple walk by, and then they turn. Oh, yeah. And then they lock, just like it did with Nan Barlow. And then a little further, the same thing happens. They do not like strangers in this town. <laughs> It's just like there, there's no tourist uh, trade in. This well, that, that's actually what that's actually what the the, the the gas station attendant says. They do not like strangers in this town. So the guy walks by, another guy walks by him, and and turns around and stares at him in lockstep, and then he goes and he talks to the priest. Yeah, and so he tells him uh, the town's filled with devil worshippers, and tonight is the witch's Sabbath. This is when Pat, Miss Russell, finds. A dead bird in her drawer. Right. Uh, and then suddenly the Reverend's like, you must leave at once. Right. Because he knows. And they try um, to get to the car and they discover the car won't work. Right. I mean, the car won't start. Yeah. And they open it up. And of course, you They've know. They've like wrecked the car. Destroyed They've the- They've like totally destroyed yes. it. So the, they do snatch Pat. The witches snatch Pat. And the Reverend sees what's happening. All this stuff is happening really fast now. And the Reverend tells Barlow, the brother, use the shadow of the cross. Um, well, whatever that means. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so the brother ends up back into the hotel. He goes into the trap door. Right. So he's now crawling through this this underground cavern. Right. And uh, he finds Nan's locket. And that's kind of like this little breadcrumbs. He's he's going along. So he makes his way to uh, the, the next room. Yeah. And sees Pat on the altar that we saw Nan Barlow before. Yes. And, and she's gonna, about she's about to be sacrificed by uh, a good old Mrs. Newless slash Elizabeth Selwyn. And then we have this good old struggle. Right. He's fighting with them. The brother, uh, Nan's brother, you know, punches and pushes and this is and that's and they get away <laughs> and they run upstairs. Of course they get away. <laughs> They run just up- one guy, just all these witches. So. Yeah, but out of the frying pan into the fire because they run upstairs. And where are they? In the graveyard. 
<laughs> with, Oops, with, wrong the, turn. with the rest of the coven. When the coven, it's a POV shot. When the when the coven is coming toward yeah. them, and they all seem like they have claws drawn. Yeah, it's beautiful. And they're about to sacrifice Pat on the yeah. altar. Elizabeth Selwyn is going to sacrifice her, and she's just about to bring the knife down. And Christopher Lee says, "Wait." For the hour of 13. Yes. So they got to wait. Hour of 11, hour of 12. <laughs> you know, can we get on with it already, please? Does it really make that much difference? So they got to wait for that chime of 13. The brother. The brother of Nan yells out to the boyfriend, the cross, put the shadow of the cross on them. Right. So he, he tries to make his way over and he's still struggling. Tries. He goes to pick up the cross to pick it up and and put the shadow of, of the cross on them. Well, she knows what's going to happen. He's grabbing the cross. Suddenly, that's like kryptonite there. Right. So the, he, she takes the sacrificial knife. Yeah. And and she is a hell of a knife thrower. She throws it from across the, the, the graveyard, boom, right into the guy's back. And you figure, that's it. He's done. That's it. Forget it. The, the, um, the, 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 these guys are all done for. That's the end of the movie. What I love, this is the next thing I love is now she's got no knife. Why wouldn't you throw the sacrificial knife? It's almost like the professor would have went like, what are you doing? <laughs> we need that. That's what the thing is what we're here for. So she now has no knife to do anything with. And Christopher Lee doesn't, he doesn't miss a beat. He just flicks a switchblade. I love that shot. He just flicks a switchblade and doesn't look at her, just hands it to her. Because all college professors carry switchblades. Exactly. Well, the boyfriend is not going to be held back by just a knife in his back. He slowly gets up this thing's in his back. He's damaged from the car it's crash. Kinda, it almost looks like the crucifixion or something. He's, yeah, yeah. He's, he's just, he picks it up and he's walking, bearing the weight of this cross, and he turns. And the music's going at this point. And he turns, and, and, and the shadow of the cross goes on one of these figures, hooded figures that's going toward him. I don't know how they did this special effect, right. but it's magnificent. Right. This beam of light sparks up in the air. It comes shooting down and hits this guy, and he starts to burst into flames. Right. Is that, so, uh, come on, is, is that no, special that, effect unbelievable? It's great. And as a kid, you're seeing this, but so the, the effect of the shadow of the cross on each of these witches, they burst they into burst flames. flames. And- What's so great is this Another guy, image that will never go out of my mind. This guy is just like barely able to walk through the cemetery. He's kind of it's lugging very dramatic, this thing. Period. It's like Excalibur, this 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 cross. He's marching through the cemetery. Vanquishing these this coven of witches. It's so spectacular an ending. You you can't you can't ask for more. So they get to the hotel and this she has figure her, behind the desk. She has her coven. Uh, you know, hood on. You know, yes, she, she has. She has the cloak on, and she's 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 there with the. Uh, she's she's sitting there with the cloak on. Yeah. So the brother reaches out to this hooded figure behind the desk, and just like Psycho with Mrs. Bates. Yes. And when Vera Miles touches her and she starts to spin around, we see that it's Mrs. Newless or Elizabeth Selwyn. Burned to a crisp. She's all charred and she's just, she's dead. But really well done because she's not like, um, <clears throat> she's not ashes or anything. No. Or skeletal. It's like her face, but yes. it's red is like a lobster and there's cracks in her face. You have to imagine the red because it's black and white. Yeah. But I mean, you can tell. <laughs> yes. It's just like, it really looks it's like charred. her flesh is just burned yeah. and yeah. like, yeah. Uh, what a great shot uh, yeah. in effect. So, so the last image we see yeah. is the placard. Oh, behind her head that gotcha. says on this on this location, location Elizabeth Selwyn was burnt at the stake in 1692. Well, it's come full circle in 1961. And and there you have it, uh, Horror Hotel, it's aka been, City of the Dead. This movie's terrific. Yeah, I mean because it was 48,000 pounds to make this movie. Yeah, in 1961 and. They get every molecule out of this thing. The cinematographer does a fantastic job. This this set design. Uh, uh, well, that's the thing that's fun about watching these films, where the because you know they're B movie films, and like you said, the budgets are limited, so you really have to get creative with the sets and everything at your disposal with to make it look good. With everything, and they remind me of the the B movies that Jacques Turner used to used to direct with for Val Luton, like yeah. the Cat People. I mean, he was able to do these things just as long as you stayed on budget. If you need a movie for Halloween, this is one of them you should look at. It's timeless. Excellent.
since this is a Halloween episode, John and I are going to throw some quick, uh, sort of off the top of our head, picks that we have to share with you so you should check out as well during this Halloween season. And I just have to say, we we both have our own choices. We didn't tell each other what our choices were, so we may have the same films. We don't it's, know. It's possible. It, this is kind of like horror bingo here. <laughs> so we're going to do this in no particular order with the films. All right, John, you go <laughs> first. Well, my first film I loved is a, is, a, is a horror film. It's another ghost story, and it's The Haunting. Oh, John. Absolutely, positively, my three favorite my, my my three favorite ghost stories are, the haunting, the innocence, and the uninvited. Uninvited again, no overt effects, all suggestive, all lighting, all mo- you know drama, and the sound. way it's done, editing, everything. It's yeah. just, and, and that's actually another uh, from another short story by Shirley Jackson, the haunting, the haunting of Hill House, which, which is a great yeah. short story. Yeah. Uh, that was directed by Robert Wise. Robert Wise. Yeah. Beautiful. Your, your turn. My, my first off the top of my head here, I just came right away. And, and because it's it's Halloween, I, I think in terms of Poe. And it's The Tomb of Lygia. Ah. It's, it's, a, it's a Roger Corman film. <laughs> uh, it's my favorite of his Poe films and starring Vincent Price. Vincent Price, And of it's course. location stuff. And I think that's why I liked it so much. Um, I, I love the other Poe films too, but this is on location. Yeah. In England, and it's it's beautiful. (laughs) And you got to love Roger Corman. Yes. I mean, a lot of his Poe films, working with a budget, right? Yeah. Is that location? I don't remember it so well. Tomb of Legia, I'm sure there's sets built and whatnot, but absolutely there's location stuff. And that's what makes it, to me, that's what makes it great. My next choice is a a film that works more on a psychological level, but there is some visuals in this that are totally freaky. It's a French film. It's called Eyes Without a Face. (laughs) I knew you were going to say that one. By Georges Franju. You turn me on to that one, John. Weren't you you home alone for that one, watching that one night or something? uh, And I didn't even see this whole film one night when I was a kid. I just saw this one scene, and it haunted me for the rest of my life. And seriously, as a young adult, I had to go find this movie. And basically, the idea is this surgeon he's determined to perform a face transplant on his daughter who was in a horrible car accident and the way he goes about doing it it's just such a great atmosphere we, 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 we were talking about that when you first told me about it and and the funny thing is the worst thing you can do as a kid is to fall asleep watching television because <laughs> you wake up at like one o'clock in the morning and some movie that you really don't want to watch right. is on and, and you only need that one seat. And I have to say, when we were kids, there was a uh, show on s- Saturday nights, I believe it was. Was it Chiller Theater? Chiller Theater, absolutely. Uh, I believe this was on that particular show. Uh, it is is a classic uh, horror film. Uh, made in the 30s. It's hard to believe it was made in the 30s because it's so disturbing. The Island of Lost Souls. Oh, yeah. Starring Charles Lawton and Bela Lugosi. Wow. Yeah. Brilliant. Black and white. <laughs> and I just remember all the creatures in that film. The special effects that are done in that, I would I would defy makeup, somebody. Right? I would def- Yes. That's what I meant, the makeup effects. I, I defy anybody today to do better. My next film, and again, these are in no particular order, The Exorcist. Oh, well, forget it. Yeah. Uh, William Friedkin, <laughs> obviously. There's no way I would watch that I was a kid. William Forget Friedkin it. from the novel by William Peter Blatty. Yeah. Uh, I just have to say, psychologically, that film disturbed me to no end. The day I saw that film, it was a rainy day. In the middle of the afternoon, I saw it, and the theaters were packed. Lines are on the block to see this film. That night, I had the worst dreams I could ever remember. It was just freaked out. You the heck out. My crazy brother, who says he likes a good nightmare, that was the only time I ever saw him sleep with the light on when he and my mother came home <laughs> from The Exorcist. Wow. So that yeah. makes a statement right there. And the other thing about that movie was two things. First of all, when your parents had that book, when it first came out, the oh, paperback the, the, the of that image book, on the book had the most horrifying oh, forget image forget of a it. woman's no contorted way. face. Yeah, no way. What wasn't going to do it? And then the commercial with the music. Yes, tubular bells, Mike Oldfield. The music, no, forget just, it. You would, I would be three rooms away na, 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 in my na, na, apartment na, 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 and hear na, na, that no. on the TV. Just, it free. I would put my fingers. in I my never ears. saw the movie, John. Yeah. Hearing that sound on WABC radio because it was, you know, a popular song on the radio. When I hear yeah. that song, I would totally freak out. I never saw the damn thing. Okay, my next one up is uh, is a favorite 1970s one. It's starring Peter Fonda, Warren Oates, and Loretta Swit before her mash days, Race with the Devil. Oh, 
with the <laughs> the uh, the Winnebago. Yes, indeed. Oh my God, terrific movie. Really fun. Really fun. Uh, that's a great movie. Yeah. And it, it's almost like a it's like a horror version of like uh, what's that Spielberg movie with the truck? Um, oh, oh, a duel. Like the chase. Yeah. In that, yeah. it's like that's great. Yeah, it's, it's really fun. Very seventies, but very fun. Um, and great cast. <laughs> you can never go wrong with War Notes. Okay, I'm going back to the beginning here. Right. One of my favorite horror films. Mm-hmm. It's actually I'm gonna I'm gonna cheat. It's mm-hmm. a cheat. Mm-hmm. It's two films by mm-hmm. James Whale, mm-hmm. Frankenstein. Oh, you're cheating now. And The Bride of Frankenstein. <laughs> the Bride of Frankenstein is one of my all-time favorite movies. Period. Yeah, I love Frankenstein. I think it's fantastic. But there's something about The Bride of Frankenstein that takes it to a whole other level. There are just some fantastic. images though in Frankenstein oh, no, that I'm are not, just pure poetry. I'm not it's trying to take like, away from it. Yeah, there's just something so wonderful about The Bride of Frankenstein. Dr. Pretorius. Boris Karloff is the monster. Yes. Um, 1931, 1935. This is more of a current day one. It's uh, a Swedish film with subtitles, and uh, it's Let the Right One In. Uh, it is a, one of the best horror films I've ever seen. It's, it's just brilliantly paced. It's shot so well, and it has so many unnerving elements to it. Yeah. That... Um, I was really struck by this. It's a it's a brilliant <clears throat> film. So if yeah, you yeah. haven't seen that one, absolutely. My next film, mm. you kind of stole my thunder a little earlier, Sorry. is Rosemary's Baby. Absolutely. Yeah. Roman Polanski, yeah. John Cassavetes, Mia Farrow. Yeah. It's the quintessential 60s yeah, horror absolutely. film. And Ruth uh, Gordon. Yeah, <laughs> who's and hilarious? Ruth Gordon. And, yeah, and and the uh, the Dakota, the building itself yeah. is a character. It is a sense. character in uh, itself. Great '60s film. Great Cassavetti's performance. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, you got to see that. Uh, I have one here. Uh, John knows very well, and uh, it might seem like an odd choice, but uh, it's a Clint Eastwood film. Oh. It was uh, starring and directed by Clint Eastwood, The High Plains Drifter. Oh, wow, look at that. You're putting that into the, the horror <laughs> Into genre. the mix. Yeah. Well, it is a, it is a horror film. A, yeah, yeah, you have yeah. to watch it, pace it, and you'll you'll get it as you see it. See the movie. Very interesting. Yeah. Uh, my next choice is a classic from the 50s, mm-hmm. uh, Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Oh, yeah, uh, unparalleled. That's and it's, Don it, Siegel, right? It's Don Speaking Siegel. of Clint Eastwood. Yes, absolutely, um, Don Siegel. And, and of course, the, the great Kevin McCarthy. That is such a creepy 50s paranoia film. To me, it's the it's it's the ultimate paranoia film yeah. because you you you're you're just you're so afraid of of everybody, <laughs> you know you you're you're just expecting everybody to be the bad guy and you're I, hiding in that room. You know, it's I, I'm gonna throw Bob a softball here. Yeah, who's coming? They're coming. <laughs> <laughs> it gets so much under your skin because you put yourself in that position where everybody. Yeah is really against you. This isn't paranoia. Right. Everybody really is against you. And you you have nowhere to go. Great, yeah, great. Great movie. Perfect one. This one is weird in this respect that you may say, well, it's not a horror film. It's psychological. It's a crime fiction or something. This is really one of the most disturbing films I've ever seen. It's a Dutch film, and it's directed by George Sloyser. It's called The Vanishing. Oh, yes. And he remade it with Jeff Bridges in English, which is kind of strange to take a, a foreign film and remake it yourself. I like that movie, but this one that's in Dutch, the original one, is very, very, yeah. very disturbing. And um, it's the kind of film that once you see it, it never lets go. Right. And I can tell you, when I'm at a rest stop <laughs> with my wife driving on a trip, <laughs> if she's in the bathroom for too long, I always yeah. go, ah. Uh, he- I better go check and see what's going on here. Keep an eye on your wife it's, at the rest stop. It's very disturbing to see. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's all the time we have for this week. We'd like to thank our friend Glenn Ornowitz for his music. And of course, our listeners for tuning in. So join us next week for another episode of Film Detour. Thanks for joining us for today's episode of Film Detour. If you like our show, please help us spread the word. Recommend us to your friends... Subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Play, and leave a review. Go to our website at filmdetour.libsyn.com to leave comments or email us with questions. That's filmdetour.libsyn.com. You can also visit us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.